So welcome to uh, Basecamp cohort four. This is uh, session one, one of seven. Uh, okay, my name is David Barreto. I'm one of the developers advocates from Stackware, focus on Stacknet, of course. Uh, you can see here my socials, my Twitter, my blog as well. And I'm here with also Manmeet and Omar, who are also developer advocates from Stackware. So in this cohort of Basecamp, cohort four, we're going to have seven sessions in seven weeks. Uh, each session lasts for two hours. What we expect roughly is that out of those two hours, 90 minutes is going to be the presentation or some live coding. Uh, we have 20 minutes for, for, for questions, uh, which you don't have to wait for the end or just whatever question you have, use the Q&A and then Mid and Omar will uh, do their best to try to answer them. If, if any of you don't know the answer, you want to discuss it, please, Omar Manmeet, interrupt me. We have a discussion live as well. Uh, we will Perfect. share in the Q&A for you guys after the session in an email, so you have that as a reference. Uh, we will have 10 minutes break as well. And just so you know, the last session of Basecamp Cohort 4 is going to happen May 24th. So it's going to be uh, kind of like two months in the future. Uh, we have some homework, but it's optional if you want to do it or not. Just take Basecamp as a way to learn everything about Strangnet and Cairo. It's up to you how much you want to get out of that. Um, so we don't have any formal graduation. We're going to be reviewing the code. Uh, we're just here to support you. That's why the Discord is important. If you get stuck with homework, go to Discord, try to get support from your peers. We will also get to hang out there uh, to help you guys as well. Uh, David, there's a question regarding the slides. Can we share the, the link? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, okay, let me uh, file, share, publish. Is there a QA? Yeah, can we have this slide? Yeah, type an answer. The link. The chat, uh, that will, so it stays there. In the chat as well? Okay. Yes, please. I, that should be working. Is it working for you, Omar? I mean, can you open it? Or anyone in the chat can come and let me know if you can open the slides. Okay. Cool. People are able to look at the slides. So as I mentioned, we're going to have seven sessions for a base camp. So today is about fundamentals, just the getting started about, you know, everything about Starknet, Cairo, hopefully to have a basic dev environment set up in our machines and to deploy an example of smart contract to Stagnet so you get to interact with the network as well. Session two next week is gonna be a deep dive. So basically it's like a part two of this same talk today. Session three is, a, is actually about Cairo one going through the syntax. And uh, if any of you have been on at Stagnet for a while, you will know that Cairo zero is a very different language from Cairo one. So we want to take some time to go through all the details about the syntax. Session four is about testing and how do you test Cairo one a smart contract. Then session five is about the Starnet architecture. We will see some architecture today at a, at a foundational level, but then session five, we're going to go deeper into it. Session uh, six, we're going to look at Cairo's architecture because Cairo has a very specific CPU architecture that we're going to discuss there. And the final session is going to be about Starks, the ZK proofs that uh, underpins um, Starnet. Okay, so some things that, that you should know uh, is that after each session, you will receive an email that's going to have a link to the recording. It's going to be a link to a YouTube video, a, a video that's going to be unlisted, so you will need the link to to see it. We're going to also share uh, the Q&A from the session. That's why uh, we're trying to push people to have any question, use the Q&A, because that way we can share with you after, so you have it as a reference. We're also going to send a feedback form because we want to hear from you guys how do we improve Basecamp session not only, Basecamp as general, how do we improve for next session for next week? So please give us your feedback. Uh, we're going to tell you what's going to be the homework in the email and also a form so you can submit uh, your homework, in this case, any GitHub repo or your stagnant address where you actually deploy it. Use the Q&A system to ask questions instead of the chat and use Discord to get help from peers. So if you provide your Discord username when you register to Basecamp, you should 
already been added to a, a private channel on Discord in the Stagnet on the yeah the Stagnet channel the Stagnet City Discord server. Uh, if you didn't, it's because there are some issues. Either you were not part of the Discord server, so try to first of all get into the Discord uh, for Stagware, and then we will add you. Some people we were unable to actually add you because there's some rules about security about the bots that we cannot bypass. So I'm sorry if that's one of you. Um, if that's your case, please use this session to ask all the questions that you have. So for today's agenda, we are going to cover why Cairo, uh, why Stagnet. So Cairo, the programming language, Stagnet, the, the layer two with, with Cairo is, is used. We're going to also see uh, a basic view of the Stagnet architecture. We're going to do some also basic view of Cairo one. We're going to discuss some of the tooling that you have available as a developer. We're going to have a little break and then uh, we're going to do some live session setting up uh, a basic dev environment from scratch. So I'll be using in this case a VM with Ubuntu so you can see the whole process from start to finish. And we also have that documented. I'll share the links to where that has been documented. Any interesting questions Omar and me to discuss now live? You can vote on your favorite question in the Q&A as well, so that gives us more visibility. All right, we, we lost some admit. <laughs> uh, so let's see some question here. Which Discord server channels is dedicated to the bootstrap, the bootcamp? Thank you. Uh, it's called bootcamp, uh, sorry, basecamp cohort four. Um, yeah, that's inside of the Stagnet Discord server. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's get started. So why, why Cairo? So I like to start this with actually a story. So imagine you are the head of a space exploration agency in a small country, and your task is to send a, a spacecraft, a small one, like a robot, to, to a planet, let's say Mars. So of course, you have to do a bunch of calculations and maybe the most important one is when is the right launch window and the, and the best trajectory. So you use the least amount of fuel. So, you know, the rocket is the smallest as possible and it takes the least amount of time. So those competitions are very complex to perform, requires a lot of computing power. So probably you will go to your engineer and say, hey, could you write in the algorithm and some very high performance language like Rust, for example, so we can get those results. We can just know those two variables, the best launch window and the best trajectory. So sure enough, they create the algorithm, uh, but it's very complex and because it's so complex it actually requires a supercomputer to be executed in any reasonable amount of time. But you have the issue that you don't have a supercomputer because, you know, you are in a small country, you don't have access to a lot of resources, but there is a rival country that has is being willing to help you out. They actually have, they have one and they have offered to execute your code and give you the answer. But then you have the issue that sure, you can provide the code to them, to the rival country, they execute it in their supercomputer and they will give you back the answer, right? So they give you those two variables, the launch window and the trajectory. But then you have a problem. I mean, how do you know that that is the right answer? That is actually the result of executing your program exactly the way you write it. How do you know that the supercomputer didn't malfunction like one bit flop during the calculation? Or maybe there was some kind of sabotage. Maybe it's even a small change in how the computation is performed could be a disaster for your space exploration. So you don't have a way to meaningfully, to be convinced that that result is actually the, what the, the, algorithm that you wrote or your team wrote actually was supposed to find. So not even with any traditional language, you cannot have that certain thing, not even Rust, not C, not any language. But with Cairo, you actually can because Cairo is a, is a provable language that when you execute it, let's say the, the three the scenario, this, this time you write the algorithm in Cairo instead of Rust, you provide that code to the supercomputer of the rival country. But now then, because it's is being used uh, with Cairo, not only they will give you the result back, and they also will give you a cryptographic proof 
that verifies or will let you verify the validity of the computation or the integrity of the computation. So now you can take that proof and you can use any regular computer and just verify the proof. And that verification will give, let you know in, in non certain terms or in, in a mathematical certainty way that the result that you're getting is actually what was supposed to come out of the execution of your program. This is called computational integrity. So now if the execution is intentionally or unintentionally modified, the proof will be invalid and you will know it right away, right? So there's no chance someone's going to sabotage your, your program or that there was some malfunction and you didn't know, you will know right away. So with this, with Cairo and the fact that you get cryptographic proofs out of execution, a regular computer, in this case, a laptop is able to keep a supercomputer honest. And that is a superpower that only languages specialized like Cairo, specialized for validity proofs, uh, can provide. Okay. Just a sec. Just trying to make the Q&A visible for me as well. David, just one question here. Do yeah. we have a channel for, in Discord for these cohorts? Uh, we do. We do. Someone actually provided Basecamp cohort 4. That's the name. Excellent. Uh, thank you for sharing. I, I saw that you. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, if, if you provided your Discord username when you registered, you should be you should be in the channel already, unless you were not part of the Discord server. So if you're if you were not, try to join the Discord server for Stagnet, and then we will uh, review the list again and add the new people that enter the server later. David, if I take yeah. just a second, could you could you please add me so I can also take a look at the questions and and be able to answer them on Zoom? To add you to Discord, uh, just a Q and I have to Discord. I don't know. Oh, I don't know why you to add you. You can just open the window. Yeah, it's opening. Yeah, we can figure out. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. Go ahead, David. And uh, yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, so we have a lot of questions here, but we're going to answer them and let you know what can we answer live. Let me just try to answer a couple of them. Maybe you can type the answer as well, so they have it as a reference. But let me just see into with the audience. Uh, let me see some of the questions. At least the one have been voted that have not been answered already. Uh, sir, I skip the intro. So what do I have to do to graduate? Can I attend all the sessions 100% do the work? We don't have a formal graduation this time. We're going to give you homework. It's up to you if you want to do it or not. Uh, just take Basecamp as a way to learn as much as you want from Cairo and Stagnet. Uh, this is because we don't have capacity to assess hundreds of people submitting homeworks every week in a reliable way. And we realize that the, the goal here is just for you guys to, to learn more. Yeah, we, we can do cool stuff and, and I don't know. You you will see that it has it it goes to any to something it, it will it will be worth it. Fox uh, says we really need have to focus on Cairo one. No reason to do Cairo zero anymore. Yes, in this base camp we're not gonna do any Cairo zero. It's just all about Cairo one this time. Just be mindful. Cairo one is super new. It was just released to mainland very recently, so it's gonna be a little bit rough around the edges, uh, but it will improve over time. How can we sure that the proof is not tampered? So the probability of you being able to create a cryptographic proof that's going to fool the verifier is one over one billion times one billion times one billion times one million. So it's very, very, very small that you can actually do that. To understand exactly the reason why, you have to wait until session seven when we discuss actually start the, the math behind uh, these uh, validity proofs. Please turn on caption. It will be super helpful. You know what? I try last time. I don't know where it is. Can you, Omar, you're the host. Can you take a look to see if there's a way to enable captions? I know the last time or some previous time we were able to, I just don't remember where. Sure, I'm, I'm looking for this. I don't promise anything. <laughs> what are you <laughs> like? All right. Let me continue. Uh, Omar, if you see any interesting question, please interrupt me and we can have a discussion. Sure. Uh, 
Okay. We, no, we are, uh, are we going to, I don't know, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So to summarize, why, why Cairo? So first of all, it allows you to create what's called a provable program, a program you can create a cryptographic proof that verify, that attest to the integrity of the computation. Uh, so as I mentioned, the cryptographic proof is generated alongside the result. Proof verification can detect cheating or malfunctioning without re-execution. That last word is the key to why we use validity proof for scaling Ethereum. We're going we're gonna to look more into that in the next section. So you can summarize this by saying that a regular computer is able to keep a supercomputer honest when you use a language like Cairo. Okay, so we talked about Cairo. So why do we need Starknet? So let's think about the issue of the scaling on layer one. So just a second, it disable Discord because I hear so many notifications that it distracted me. Okay. Uh, so in layer one, in case of Ethereum, we have what's called a block producer, which is going to give you, okay, it's going to tell the network, hey, here's the new state of the network. Let's say the state is 42. But of course, all the other validators in the network, they just don't going to take the word uh, for it and say, oh yeah, sure, it's 42. They will actually execute independently the same block and verify that they all get to the same result independently. So that's the so that's part of the consensus that the actual result, they all they get to a consensus is actually 42. So as you can see, even a small or a simple computation takes tens of thousands of computer to actually execute, right? Because they all need to execute that independently and get to a consensus. So you can see that it's fairly inefficient in that regard. So this is how Ethereum achieves computational integrity, but by re-executing re the same transaction over and over. In the case of a Starknet, we execute only once, but then we verify everywhere. So when you, on a Starknet, you will do something similar. You, you know, process transactions, and then you propose a new state. Let's say the new state is 42. But not only you provide the new state, you also provide the cryptographic proof. And now the validators were just Ethereum nodes, Ethereum validators. They don't have to re-execute the same block to see if it's 42. They only have to verify the cryptographic proof that was provided. And that will give you, give them mathematical certainty that the actual answer of the new state is 42 without having to re-execute all the transactions in the block. And as you can see, the verification takes only a fraction of the actual underlying computation. So you can see it visually here why a layer two like a Stagnet is so much more performant because now you don't require every single node of the network on layer one to re-execute all the transactions. They only need to verify the cryptographic proof and that takes much less effort. How, what's the connection, how less of an effort? Well, if the execution takes n steps, right? The execution done by the sequencer on a Stagnet, then the validation of the cryptographic proof associated with it actually takes log square of n. So this polylogarithmic relationship, and it's easier to see in this graph. So this blue line going vertical, uh, sorry, but going in, in the diagonal is actually uh, the amount of steps of certain computation. And you can see the red line is the amount of steps of the verification of the associated cryptographic proof. So the bigger the gap between these two curves, the more you achieve in saving computing power from the whole network to achieve the same result of creating new states. So you can think of a validity proofs, uh, this analogy, a validity proof is to computation what zip is to a file size. It's all about compression. Just in the case of validity proof, it's a compression of computation while zip is a compression of file size. Um, let's see, uh, any interesting questions, any question here, Omar, Manmit? Uh, yes. If I inquire, you asking, what is a supercomputer, super a honest supercomputer, honest supercomputer? Uh, you don't need the supercomputer to be honest, uh, as long as they use the Cairo VM, uh, and you have access. We're going to have to see, you'll you need to have access to the underlying Cairo program 
So we, we all have an agreement which program is being executed. But as long as the supercomputer uses Cairo VM, uh, it will able to generate this cryptographic proof that the computer will not be able to tamper. Or, or if they do, you with a verifier independently, you will be able to spot when they're trying to cheat. In what do you case mean, of when target, you say, oh, sorry, when you say cheating and being honest, what do you mean? Like, wh what is we, what is cheating in, in this context? Cheating will be trying to create a validity proof that try to attest to a computation that didn't happen. Or to attest that some computation that apparently happened uh, provide a completely different result that it should have done. And in you being trying to fool the verifier that you have on your side. So it's the, it's the, it's the combination of both that give the security of a system. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, Please, people in the chat, please use the Q&A. Don't use the chat for questions so we can keep track. Right. Yes, we're focusing on the on the on the Q and A, and also David. Here's a question: on How can as Leo join the Discord? I guess they simply go into the Discord of of Starknet, join, and what? Yeah, if you can if you can share the if you can share the invite link to the Discord server, um, put it there in the sure. Q and A would be helpful. Oh, also let me invite you to the Telegram. I will send you a link in the chat so you can join the Telegram of English speakers. Uh, it's for only for builders, so if you want to go there and we can, yes, talk a little bit more and and contribute, you can ask questions and so on. So I will I will send you the link also for the Discord. Cool, thank you, Omar. All right, let's talk a little bit more about validity proofs. So validity proofs are an implementation of what's called the zero knowledge proofs or CK proofs, and it uses CK proof to guarantee computational integrity. That's basically to guarantee that certain output is a result of a computation with an uh, input. So you can think about, about that is like doing the right thing even when no one is looking. That's a one way to think about computational integrity. So we use validity proofs and CK proofs not for privacy, which is a common misconception about Stargate. We use it for a scaling Ethereum, as I showed you before, the comparison of the layer one and the layer two validators. Uh, so Stargate right now is not about privacy. It might be in the future, but right now it's not. That's why we think that ZK rollup is a misnomer because it can imply some privacy. We prefer the term validity rollup for Stargate. And to be fair, pretty much any other ZK rollup out there uses validity rollups. None of them, to my knowledge, actually are focused on privacy after I think Aztec shut down their own layer two. And very importantly, the type of ZK proof that Stagnet uses is a stacks. We don't use snacks. Probably you have heard both being ZK proofs, uh, but we use Starks. And there's an important reason why we chose to go with Starks and snacks that I want to review here. So if you compare these two types of ZK proofs, uh, the verification time for a, for a Stark proof is polylogarithmic, right? If you recall the, the chart that I showed you. In the case of a snark, it's actually constant. So it doesn't matter how complex the underlying computation is, the amount of work to verify the computation is always the same. Now, the proof size that we send to layer one for verification in the case of Stark, it's pretty big. It's, it's about 400 kilobytes. In the case of the snark, it's pretty small. It's only close to 300 bytes. So it begs the question, if the snarks are so much better than the Stark, why did we actually chose a Stark and not Stark or a Stagnet? There are very two important reasons for that. First of all, when you use snacks, you have to go through the trusted setup, the, the, the trusted ceremony, where you have to fit the system with a, with a secret, and you have to make sure that the secret is properly disposed because if that secret is being leaked, the whole system is compromised. Uh, in the case of Stark, we don't need a trusted setup. It works even without that. So it's, it's one less trust assumption for the security of the system. It's also very important, the Starks are quantum secure, which the Starks are not. So whenever quantum computers come online with sufficient power, they will actually break a Stark, but they will not break a Stark. So we are making a bet on the future to, you know, the maximum level of security that we can think of. Of course, that has a price in the proof size, but it's better to be safe than sorry in the future. That's all at least we'll be thinking. 
David, good yeah. question here. So there are some people that go in the Discord of Starnet what they have not been added yet to the channel. So what what will we how can we proceed in that case? If you if you join just recently, uh allow me some time to get in touch with the the, the Discord mod who is in charge of the channel so they can add you. Uh just make sure that you actually provided that your Discord username when you register. Uh, and we will try again to add you to the server. Some people might try to join the Starware server and might not be able to, and that's because of security bots. That's something that we cannot do anything about that. But if you actually were able to join, we will add you to the Discord server just maybe tomorrow morning. Maybe, maybe they can send their Discord uh, name in the chat, right? And we can... Yeah, the... Omar, if you can take the note of that, it will be super helpful. Perfect. Okay. So if you maybe maybe, that... maybe start Q and A and and you know, people add their Discord username, so we have one place to track all the people who are added to the channel. Oh, no, I think it's okay in the chat. We can download it and then more and okay. Yes. So so please add to your to to the chat your Telegram your your Discord name in case you haven't been added to the Discord channel, and we will add you. Thank you. Okay, let me see more questions. I wonder if this is a way to hide the one that's been answered. Okay. But yeah, those are answered. Is there a possibility to keep the algorithm private so the supercomputer cannot steal algorithm and they use it later? And not now. No, because as I mentioned, the StarkNet is not about privacy. It's about scaling. And so you have to share the algorithm. So basically when you use a StarkNet, you have to publish your smart contract so it becomes visible to anyone to use it. If you answer it, David, please pull, please click on answer like so we know you already answered. Uh, okay. There's two questions from Fox from XP. So, man, you know that there are... Okay. <laughs> What do you think about the snarks using a trusted, without trusted setup? They are using some kind of VRFs. What do you think about that? That I'm not sure. I haven't digged so deeper into the tech stack to know what's the implication. But I know that for Ethereum, there's a push right now for KCG commitments, I think. That's, that's part of the, set, the, 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 the secret, right? We're all collectively creating a secret to fit into the system, to provide security to, to, the, to the stacks. Uh, so that's why it can be done, but then you have to make sure that you do the KCG commitment ceremony correctly. Good up. Yes, you for second. Uh, so real quick. So when you have a circuit and the verifier has to read it, so basically you have two parties, prover and verifier, all of this trusted setup, yada, yada, yada is basically done. So the verifier can read something shorter than the actual circuit and verify that the circuit is correct. So we have to, as David has been saying, go through some sort of a compression process from circuit to compressed information. And then that compressed information is what the verifier reads. This compression requires, in the case of SNARKs, which is the first protocol to have been introduced in the space, it requires some randomness. Now, whether you use verifiable randomness or I guess unverifiable randomness, that doesn't change. Uh, the security vulnerability that we are talking about is that even if you do have verifiable randomness and someone is able to get access to that or leak that information after the trusted setup, then the, ver the prover can basically cheat and create false proofs and the verifier will not be able to like figure out what's going on. So, so that's kind of like, what we're doing here, starts require no um, no randomness to generate. They they only use a collision resistant hash function, which is also why they're quantum secure. So so that's kind of like just a, a, a fundamentally superior tech stack, I guess. There's a very interesting question from Zebrin Islary that says, aside from blockchain, where can Cairo be used? Well, let me try to. I see some very good answers already from from your peers. So let me just provide my own answer as well. Um, one example that I, I like to think about is in the future, you should be able to generate proofs directly on your computer, right? 
and then submit the proofs to some server. And the server is the one who runs the verifier. And I like to think gaming is a good example of this. When it's, it's a common issue in gaming that people actually modify their client to cheat, right? And, and that's an issue when you have a multiplayer game. With a language like Cairo, you can technically request your client to every, every so often create a, a validity proof out of the execution of your client and send that validity proof to a server which runs the verifier just to check that you are not cheating, that you are actually executing the client the way that it was supposed to, to be. Right? So if you try to cheat, if you try to modify your client, the server will know because the validity proof that you send regularly will fail. So that's one use case. Uh, and there are people actually doing research in the topic to actually run even on a smartphone. The main issue right now is that creating proof is a very uh, resource intensive process. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done uh, to get to that point. But it's an interesting thought as well, how to use Cairo in a different setting that is not stagnant. They also, but, uh, we're also doing something with Bitcoin, right? Oh, that's great, yeah. Can you explain? Can you elaborate, any of you? To be honest, I cannot elaborate. I have not very aware of what is happening. But I know that there is something being built. I will send you the report to the chats. Something is being built. I don't know exactly what, but it is in order, in order to scale Bitcoin, which is start. Yeah. And it has been very successful within the Bitcoin community. So you know that's something that's something we can say about it. And, and also, uh, David, there's a question about the pool will be open source. Let me first ask the, answer the question about the Bitcoin. Uh, actually, that's something that the, the Bitcoin community is very well aware of. I think the Ethereum community is not as much, but on the Ethereum community, they're actually using our technology to create a very light Bitcoin client. They basically, uh, I think the basic idea is that a cryptographic proof or validity proof is generated out of a regular Bitcoin client. And then when you want to sync a new Bitcoin client yourself, you don't have to download the whole blockchain to calculate the UTXO yourself. You can just verify the cryptographic proof of all the calculations that other server actually perform for you. And then you can sync to the latest UTXO, just download the database and verify the cryptographic proof associated with the execution to get to the current UTXO. So now you can sync a Bitcoin client in a matter of probably minutes instead of days. I forgot the name of the project. Was it Zero. Uh, Clement here has zero sync. Clement yeah. Kofit here added the, the link to the repo with the chat. Thank you very much, Clement. You can go and see it. The, to be honest, uh, there's a lot of very cool stuff that is being built right now at the at the edge of the technology. So, and it the Starry community is amazing. To, to be honest, it's amazing. They are building some very cool stuff. And yeah, they, really. Um, David, do you want to 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 do the proper open source question? The proof open source, yes. So right now it's not open source, but we made a commitment to actually, we will make it open source. We're just trying to tackle other areas of the blockchain first, especially the sequencer is our first target. It's just already, we're doing a full rewrite in Rust open source, want to decentralize also the sequencers before we can tackle the, the, the prover. But it is the goal to decentralize the whole stack. It's just not yet, we're not, at that level yet. So right now the sequencer and the prover are actually centralized, which is the There's same for good. any other, every other CK problem right now that is centralized. There's all the now actually open source. Yeah, go ahead, Omar. <laughs> There's also a question from Paul asking, can you explain why Stark is quite secure and not Stark? So real quick, the, the part of the cryptography that is being vulnerable right now to quantum attacks are those using elliptic core uh, cryptography, such as Starks, as Ethereum and Bitcoin and so on. And the Starks are not relying on this kind of primitives. Not They are not using elliptic cores. They are using hashing functions as symmetric key encryption. So uh, it is believed that these particular primitives will be quantum resistant. So that that's the main reason, the elliptic core cryptography. Yeah, at least right now we don't know we don't know any algorithm able to break a hash function using quantum computers, but we do know an algorithm to break elliptic curves and, and other cryptographic primitives using elliptic curves using quantum computers. The, the algorithm exists. It's just waiting for a quantum computer to be sufficiently powerful to run it. And the day will call. The day will call when we have that. A lot of development has been done in the quantum computing side. But yes. 
And one of the goals they have is actually trying to break, use this, this, alg this algorithm to break the elliptic cryptography. It's actually a metric for how good the, these computers are. So it will come a day, and wh when that day comes, the first thing they will do is break this elliptic cryptography. All right, thank you for the question. Um, me and Omar, feel free to keep answering them on the q and just going to keep moving forward because of time constraints. All right, so you probably have heard, like in a Starknet, we use the Cairo VM. We don't, we don't use the EVM. So so why is that? So on one side, you have ZK EVMs, right, which some famous ones are like the Polygon, Hermes, uh, Scroll, ZK Sync. They try to be as compatible as possible to the Ethereum virtual machine, while the Starnet is actually using its own virtual machine called the Cairo VM. So these two approaches is trying, to, they're trying to optimize for very different things. So CK EDN is trying to optimize for having max compatibility with current smart contracts deployed on layer one, but they sacrifice performance because the EVM was created for a particular CPU architecture or a traditional CPU architecture that is not really um, friendly to CK circuits. That's why Cairo VM or, or a stock we decided to create our own virtual machine so we can create a, our model, a computer that is exactly or fine tuned for validity proofs. So we're thinking about how do we extract the most performance of the network long term. Amit, do you have any more comments? You're more an expert of this area than I am probably. Oh, I, I, I would leave it at that today uh, and okay. not deeper, but we can. But yeah, the main difference is, of course, you can compile your code directly into EVM by code on ZK EVMs. With us, you have to go through uh, Sierra and the, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you speak more about it. We, we have a session six. It's going to be about the Cairo architecture. So probably a lot of the, a lot of these uh, questions are going to get answered, how the architecture of Cairo actually looks like, what the, the Cairo VM actually looks like. Um, just a quick comparison. If you have read Vitalik's article about the CK EVM classification, he classifies CK EVM in four categories, type one to four. So type one is basically, uh, no changes to the Ethereum virtual machine, you know, full compatibility, but the performance will be very, very slow to create a cryptographic proof out of those executions. So pretty much no one is attempting this right now. Uh, type two is that you use most of the EVM, but you change at least the data structure for storage to achieve high compatibility. At least you're gonna have some smart contracts that are, you will need to be modified, but the performance is still very slow. Then you have type three, where you have compatibility, but you have to modify something like a storage, hashes, pre-compiles to make it a little more friendly to the new architecture. So you have partial compatibility, it's not like you can deploy every single smart contract as is to a, la a layer two with these characteristics. The performance is still gonna be slow, at least uh, in theory, technically. And we have projects doing that, like Scroll, Her Polygon Hermes, ZK Sync, even Kakarot, which is a layer three on top of Starnet, are actually uh, tended to be type three CK EVMs. But then you have the type four, where they implement a completely different virtual machine. They are, they're not compatible. Uh, with the smart contracts deployed on Ethereum using Solidity, but the, the upside is that it's very fast to create the validity proofs. So you have two main projects competing in the space. Obviously, Starnet is one of them, and you can consider it to be a CK EVM because you can use Starnet with a compiler called Warp to compile Solidity smart contract into Cairo VM, and the other one is Polygon Smiting. So we are really focused on performance and long-term view of uh, scaling Ethereum. Okay, to summarize. Maybe, yeah. Ma ma maybe quoting here, Eli Ben Sasson, he said, like, uh, we really believe in Star Wars that the future of Scalability will be built using Cairo, using Cairo, or as you know, GVM. Because David said, uh, the, the only focus of Cairo, the only focus of Cairo, its goal is to scale Ethereum. That is not the goal of the EVM, right? The EVM uh, goal is to maximize centralization, which is great and it's very relevant. Well, in Cairo, we're already giving as a we're already thinking as a given the part of the security and the centralization that Ethereum gives. So now we're focusing only on scaling, and that's why we really believe that Cairo is the way to 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 
to scale Ethereum. The problem here is, of course, image from, from David's show, there's already an Ethereum building tooling, tooling of boundary, we have profile app and so on. And and those we don't have in, in Cairo or Starnet. We need to build a new tooling. However, the tooling is being built by the day. So we have Protostar, which is kind of similar to Foundry. We have a, a actual Drawful, no, sorry, which uh, we have several APIs and SDKs that we can use to interact with the Starnet and Cairo. So the tooling is getting much, much better. So we are able to write Cairo yeah, and scale both the, the social parts and the scalability as lower fees and faster faster transactions. Cool, thank you, Omar. All right, to summarize, why is Target? First of all, it guarantees computational integrity without re-execution. Uh, proof verification is cheaper than the underlying computation. So remember the polylogarithmic relationship with the underlying computation. We, we can think about that as computation compression. So we use CK proof for scaling, not for privacy. That's very important to keep in mind, at least not yet. And we use CK proofs, we use Starks CK proofs and not Snarks because Starks are quantum secure. That's really the main reason we're thinking long-term and this is why we have the trade-off. Cool. Let's talk about at a high level, the architecture of Starnet. So in, in my previous example, the story about the, you know, the, the head of the space exploration, the, the person actually got convinced that the result is what it whatever that is, right? Because he was able to verify independently the cryptographic proof in his laptop. But then how do you, how is other people going to trust that that is actually the result, right? Because so far only this guy was able to verify the validity proof, but not Alice. So that's why for, for Alice to trust, a couple of things are needed. First, you need to make the Cairo program publicly accessible for anyone. She should be able to independently verify the proof, basically run her own layer two node. So she needs a Starnet. So the Starnet is a layer two, right? So that's why I present here Ethereum at the bottom as layer one. So on a Starnet, when you send a transaction, uh, you send the transaction to what's called the sequencer, right? And the sequencer is, is like the block producer of Starnet. And it uses, that's where the Cairo VM lives and also where the Starnet OS lives. And the sequencer is just going to take all the transactions. It's going to validate them just to make sure that the signature is correct, that the person is able to do these things or be, been able to use this user account. It's going to uh, bundle them into blocks. And it's going to calculate what's the new state of the network based on the execution of this block, right? Similar to a block producer on layer one in this, this case. The interesting thing here is that out of the execution of all the transactions in a block, the sequencer sends uh, what's called an execution trace to the prover that we call it Sharp in the case of a Starknet. Sharp is because shared prover. It's used by Starknet, it's used by StackX as well. So with this execution trace, the prover is able to compute the, the validity proof to attest to the integrity of the computation done by the sequencer. And this validity proof is eventually sent to layer one as cold data to a verifier smart contract um, that is written in Solidity, right? This is open source, anyone can see it. So the verifier is going to take the validity proof and it's actually going to perform the verification on layer one. This case is the 10,000s of Ethereum computers are going to perform this computation independently. And if the verification is actually successful, then the sequencer is going to change the state difference, but changing the state before and after the block was executed, again to the layer one as call data, to a different smart contract that we call a stagnant core. And we use that as our data availability layer. Right? We want to publish this data on layer one. So now we can have full nodes or stagnant full nodes who gets uh, what is the state of, the, of the, the latest block or the state of the network. It gets that from the sequencer currently because as of, as of now, these are two centralized entities. But the fact that we send this state diff to layer one, it means that if for some reason the sequencer or the connection between the full node and sequencer fails, you are able to recreate the layer two current state by reading or indexing data from the standard core smart contract. So you can recreate the data from layer one independently if you 
if there is a situation that the sequencer stop responding to uh, layer two full nodes. So at a very high level, this is how Starnet works. So I, I went through some of the uh, modules. So as I mentioned, the sequencer validates, executes, and bundles transactions into blocks. The prover creates stack proofs for a Starnet and a Stark X. That's what's called Sharp or Shared Prover. The verifier is a layer one smart contract verifies the stack proof sent from Sharp. Stark Core is another layer one smart contract that just stores. It stores is a, it's a big word because actually we only send it as call data. It's not get stored at the contract level storage for uh, cost reasons. Uh, and we use that as a the data availability layer. Finally, the full node provides data to layer two taps. David, can you give me a second? Yeah, yeah sure. Perfect. So regarding the start of your presentation, there was a question from Eliel. Sorry, Eliel, for coming. There are a lot of questions that were answering each of them. So Eliel ask, uh, do we send the algorithm or the data to the rival country when you were talking about this part? We send it. Oh, you mean in the, in, in the example at the very beginning? Yes, at the very beginning. So what are we sending, the algorithm or the data? the algorithm like the program you can you can send yeah the program it's just in reality you don't send the program as is you send the bytecode of the program right the the low level Cairo assembly program to the to the supercomputer okay no, that's not perfect yeah yes okay. thank you very much David hello all questions uh, from Amit go ahead go ahead Omar Oh, no, uh, our, our is asking, can you use a different data availability layer like Celestia, for example? The answer is yes. We are working on, on the Validiums, which is going to be a great innovation where we will be able to do the, 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 the data availability part using different, the, the, the different kind of uh, services, for example, Celestia, Filecore, a USB, if you want. So it's going to be very interesting. You will be able to write Cairo code where you can declare variables that are going to be stored in the on-chain and some variables that will be not stored on-chain. It will be stored, I don't know, uh, off-chain or, or maybe it's an STL or somebody else. So like, that would be very, very cool with Validium. Yeah, it's just a comment. It's called Volition because Validium is what StarkX uses. So we have three different data availability modes. Right now, only two, really. Rollup is the one used by Starknet, will be published to layer one. Validium, which is used by StarkX that we are not covering here, but it's another technology developed by Starkware. And then we have Volition that we want to we want to implement on StarkNet, I don't know, this year at some point, which is going to allow you to choose where to store your data. So you have different costs for your transaction. You're going to store it on layer one or have a maxim maximum security, or do you want to store it in a, some other place that could be Celestia or a consortium of, of people storing data that's going to make it be cheaper. So we don't have a lot of details about that, but we know that is a path forward for a standard to enable volition. Uh, David, do you have curious, is asking for the link to the repo of the verifier smart contract in layer one. Do we have those? Have yeah, those? yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, you in the Carolang repo. Oh, wait. Uh, Okay. Uh, it is, it is public. If you go to, to the Caroline repo, uh, useful info, important addresses, the verifier address. Yeah, that's here. So you can, is there, is there a question here? I don't know what the question is. I put it on the chat, but oh, can you please put it on the, on the Q and A? So. Yes, yes, the question is, can we get the link to the repo of the verifier smart contract? So I, I will show you. All right, so this is the link to the to the deploy smart contract. To see the actual source code, you have to go to the Cairo line on GitHub. And and in here, uh, I think it's here, Starware. Oh, man, I know I, know I saw it. So many, but I don't remember. Yeah, no, I don't know. I can, I can search for it. Or good. Yes. It is, yeah. It is open software. I've seen it. It's there somewhere. I need to find. 
<laughs> Perfect. Cool. Uh, section four. So let's talk about Carol One. Like we just recently, uh, we just recently released this new version of the language, which is very different from Cairo Zero, but it's much better than Cairo Zero. So, Cairo One is a high-level language, right? Which is, makes it easier to learn compared to Cairo Zero, which was more of a low-level language. The syntax of Cairo One is heavily inspired by Rust, which also makes it like a strongly typed language. So, if you know Rust, you will feel comfortable with Cairo One. Uh, when you compile a Cairo smart contract, uh, it doesn't directly compile to the Cairo VM bytecode, which we call it the Cairo assembly. It compiles to an intermediate language called Sierra. Sierra stands for Safe Intermediate Representation because this is what allows to create validity proofs even when a transaction fails, which was not possible before. And now, because of Sierra, basically, Sequencers are always compensated for their work, even if a transaction fails. And in the near future, we allow for transactions to be reverted, much in the way that happens on layer one. So you can see on the right side, you start with a Cairo one smart contract, you compile it to Sierra, and then you send this to the sequencer. The sequencer that compiles to Cairo assembly, that we also call it CASM. And from the Cairo assembly, the execution of this Cairo assembly bytecode by the sequencer, that's where we uh, derive the validity proof on the proof and we sent to layer one. So take a look. This is how it looks like an example, a smart contract on Cairo one. You can see at a, at a, a glimpse, it looks a lot like Rust where you can do some meta programming with macros. Uh, this is how you bring functions into scope. This is how you define storage variables. You have to name a struct storage has to be the name. And then you define the properties of all the storage variables. Um, felt is still the data data type, but then we have more data types that we can use that before in Carol zero was not possible. One very commonly used is U256, which is commonly used in Solidity. Uh, this is how you write to storage. The, this is the syntax. This is how you read from storage. For now, just take a look. Today is not the, the day to focus on Carol one a lot, just for you to have a taste of how it looks like. And, and now you, this is how you define variables with the keyword let, which if you use Cairo zero, <laughs> you know that before there was like a four different ways to define a variable. Now we have only one. So it's a much nicer language to play with. Uh, so there's a thing called regenesis that is all about closing the gap. So as I mentioned briefly that in Cairo zero, transactions, failed transactions cannot be proven. And because they cannot be proven, that opens the door for what's called a denial of service attack on the sequencer because the sequencer gets to execute a transaction to the point where it failed. And then it cannot add it to the block because a, a validity proof cannot be created out of a failed transaction in Cairo zero. Cairo's, Cairo one actually fixes this problem, but it means that eventually Cairo zero smart contracts needs to be disabled from the network for security reasons. So we have two important events that happen over time. The one that happened recently is the deployment of Stargate 0.11 to mainnet. Because before 0.11, mainnet only supported Cairo 0.10 smart contract, right? Uh, after the deployment of the, the, the Stargate 0.11, now both languages are supported, Cairo 0.10 and Cairo 1. At some point in time, we're gonna go through regenesis, maybe four or six months, where we actually gonna disable all the Cairo 0 smart contract and only Cairo one is going to be supported from that point forward. But in the meantime, we have a migration window where we provide mechanism for you to be able to upgrade your already deployed smart contract from Cairo zero to Cairo one while preserving your same, uh, storage layout, the same storage, uh, values, the same address. So in a way that is completely transparent to your end users using your smart contracts but you will have this migration window to go through it because after Regenesis, we got to disable all the Cairo zero smart contract and that from that point forward, it's only going to be Cairo one from that point on. And this is where we are right now, just at the very beginning of the migration window. So let me go to the summary and I stop for some questions because probably there's some. So Cairo one, Cairo one is a high level language inspired by Rust. Sierra allows for reverted transactions before were not possible. We, had, we don't have reverted transactions just yet. 
we need a little bit more um, work on, on the target to allow that, but it's now technically feasible to do it. Uh, smart contracts can be upgraded from Carol 0 to Carol 1 while preserving the state and their current address where it's been, they've been deployed. Cairo 1, uh, Stargate already supports Cairo 1 in the tested and on mainnet as well. And Regenesis will disable Cairo 0 code, and that's going to happen before six months in the future. So let me stop here for, for questions. I might better some. I, uh, there's a question from Anonymous attendee. <laughs> it is possible, is it possible to build circuits like Circle or Noir with Cairo 1? I don't think so, because this is a high-level language, but I'm not that much of an expert to get deeper into the reason why, but <laughs> intuitively, I don't think so. Yeah, but from what I've seen, you see like a, like a layer 3, we, we can be able to, to, to use Noir, and then that compile it so you can get into Cairo. So it would be interesting. And actually, Francois mentioned something before of you will be, you can be able to Proof of snaps into Starnets is something that's been worked in Garaga. I think yeah, you can. You can you can create your own verifier with Cairo, right? There's a smart contract. It actually it exists. There are the Starks verifier, there are different Stark verifiers as well. So really the you can implement your own layer three right now in, and not wait for a Starkware or a Starknet to evolve to the point that we make all these things that the official verifier available in layer two. Perfect. Also, Severin is asking, can we expand more on Sierra? Sierra, we'll be, we'll be looking at session six, right? David, more about Sierra? Uh, probably. I haven't, we haven't discussed exactly what's going to be coming in the chapter, but probably yes. For now, just keep in mind that it's going to be an intermediate language. So when you compile uh, in your computer before you deploy, you no longer comp compile directly to Cairo Assembly, you compile to Sierra, and that's what you deploy to Starnet. And then on a Starnet, the sequencer compiles your Sierra bytecode to Cairo assembly code. Yeah, this is a great invention. And for, from the, for those of you who want to, for example, do audits, security audits, you can, you, learning Sierra will be key for you. To, uh, it's, it's very important. It's like learning Jewel for, for layer one. I see yeah. a question. question. Uh, yeah, more question. Go, Omar. I can see you. Can you can you order by nope. most of vote because I, I see some questions being unanswered with four votes, three votes. <laughs> yeah, it's sorry. So we're we're working on that. We have a lot. So there's a question by Glim. He's asking Glim, by the way, he's French living in Mexico. Hey Glim. So in the centralized start, the sequencer will be a full node, and there will also be a full node that are not a sequencer, right? Which means all the sequences will participate to consensus and all other full nodes are only relying Relaying data to that or other nodes. Is that correct? Uh, uh, with the bank consensus. So, the, the how this in place is going to look like is a, is a moving target. I don't have a clear answer. Of course, the first uh, sequencer will be the first one to be decentralized, and it means that they need to reach consensus, right? As any decentralized system. Uh, do they need to be full nodes? I mean, sequencer will they need to store uh, the the current state of the network, right? As well as a full node, but a full node can exist in independently from a sequencer, right? You, they don't have to be the same thing. They can be independently, and I think that's the future. But they will probably share some modules. Like right now, for example, if you use Papyrus as a full node, it uses a module called Blockifier that we are going to introduce also into the new sequencer that has been rewritten in Rust. So they're going to share some of the same primitives for storing the state. But there are two different systems in the network. Also, we have like clients, right? Like Virus being built also by the community. We also have Virus, which is inspired by, I forgot the name of the other, the, not Horus, it's uh, ah, forgot that there's a uh, there's a light client developed by A16Z for Ethereum that we're using to build Horus on top of that, which I forget the name. You were also met, were mentioning that Francois, thank you very much. He has been answering a lot of questions. So thank you very much, Francois. Uh, 
what else can we do? We start with caution to reduce the proof size, like the mina protocol with snaps. Is that a okay? Can we do that? Uh, we do, we do do that. Yeah, the sharp. Uh, Manmeet, go ahead, please. You can answer that. Oh yeah. So I was just gonna say we do not. So so initially we generate one proof object per computation, mm -hmm. but then uh, basically whilst we're still in the off chain environment, we batch those proofs together and keep on generating smaller proofs for a certain period of time. And only at the end of that period of time do we send the one really sort of like root proof down to Ethereum layer one. So in that way, we actually get in hundreds of thousands of transactions through one proof object. Yeah, on session four, when we go deeper into the standard architecture, we're gonna look at the how the prover uh, achieves recursion. All right, sorry, let me move on because the time is all okay. flying. About <laughs> you, right? Take care. If we have time at the end, we will go back to see some of these questions. But please try to answer some of them uh, directly on the Q&A. Um, so some of the tools that you should have if you want to get into Stagnet, first of all, it's a, it's a, a wallet. And there are two main ones. You have Argent X and you have Bravos. Argent X, they have uh, a browser extension. Uh, as you can see for Google Chrome, for Brave, for, for Firefox. Bravos, the same, also a browser extension, but Bravos also has a mobile wallet, which is very interesting how they implement that and how they use account abstraction. So pick the one that you like the most and make sure that you have it installed in your browser so you can follow along some of the exercises. We have two different block explorers, Walcon Voyager and the other one called Stark Scan. Both are great options, so pick the one you like the most. Uh, and we have some tools for developers. One of them is Protostar, which right now, I mean, I actually was thinking about removing Protostar for now because it's, it's definitely a full rewrite of how Protostar works with Scarab One using a thing called Scarab. So maybe put that on ice in the meantime, but uh, just know that there's a tool similar to Foundry on Ethereum. So you can test your smart contract using the same language that you used to program the smart contract, in this case, Caro. And also we have a uh, collaboration with Open Zeppelin that they actually develop um, smart contracts for Cairo, following some of the best practices for, you know, ESC20, ESC721, uh, and, and so forth. Other tools that we have available, we have a plugin for Hardhat if you want to test using JavaScript. We have a DevNet similar to Ganache as well if you want to run it locally. We have a library for React for your decentralized app. Uh, we have different SDKs for different languages for TypeScript or JavaScript, for Python, for Java, Kotlin, Scala, and for iOS. So whatever you're building, we have an SDK for that. Many of them right now are going through the process of upgrading to support Cairo 1. Uh, so just, just be mindful of that. All right. So let's take a break. Uh, 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes. How much do we have? Let's let's have sorry five minutes because we have we're gonna jump into the live coding session so just have like a you know washroom break so get some coffee and we'll get back in five minutes sorry I'm just gonna mute myself and turn off the camera and I'll be back in a moment I'll be answering some questions and so I'm not gonna talk just answering questions from the Q and A. It would be great to have a chat GPT train using information from all these questions and the documentation and so on. So we can answer these questions uh, faster because there's a lot of questions here and I apologize to everybody that has been waiting for their answer. We're working on that. We already answered 50 questions, so <laughs> bear with us. We're working on that. But yes, if somebody wants to work on a chat GPT, I was actually looking at something like that, maybe using that backup model, which was released by, by Stanford. That would be amazing to have. So also, uh, feel free to join the Telegram channel. Let me, I will send the link again. So you can get in there, there you can ask questions. You, if you want to, or, to organize a meetup, whatever, let, let us know, we can help. And yes, let's make a, a nice communication. And, I thank you very much, William, for your questions. Thank you very much, everybody, for what we're willing to put them snore. And there's fresh soil around the world. Yes. 
in a way, French people are always exploring these like very new technologies. French, I don't know if they like this kind of. I was working in AI before coming into Star Wars, and always the the French are, are always in these experimental technologies. It's very interesting. Also in AI, you can see them in blockchain, but also not not everywhere in blockchain. You, you can see them a lot in, in this like state of the art. Uh, <laughs> say with the yard blockchains like Starnet. Hey, Francois. Ah, Francois, you're from, from Car Carbonable. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Greetings. And thank you for, for your help on the, on the question. Omar, did you share the uh, uh, telegram uh, telegrams with people? I'm not sure I, I can hear you. You know what? I cannot enable the my video. Yes, you will share your screen. Uh, you will share your screen. Oh, you're... Sorry, he was. I was on mute. Yeah. No, no, my my camera. <laughs> wait, get, let me see. Wait, wait. Just unable to start video. You can start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, just a second. Let me see. Our, try it. Try again, please. Now. Really worth. I think in the security Thank section. I don't have a security section. Okay, can you join again? Maybe. Yeah, I'll try to live in join again. Well, in the meantime, we're working on the on the Starnet group and the Cairo group also in the community, and I will give you a small primer here for all of the of you that of you that very similar to the with people in spirits. So the difference here is that it's going to be completely decentralized. So if somebody of you wants to support us in building the the book.starnet.io if let us know because it's very very new so we're still working on that the getting the started part is already up to date but we will have more and more and more content here for example we'll have content on the starts so there was a question on how starts actually work and you can see them here in several chapters 
talking about that. But we're lacking a lot of information. So there's some persons already contributing to it. But if you want to contribute to, for example, talking about wallets, bridge, block explorers, startup devnet, everything that, that David has already talked about, let us know. Let us know. We will we'll be happy to have you collaborate with us in this. So we will we'll be sharing this in the Telegram and also in the Discord in the next days. Uh for you to contribute if you want. And yes, where this is a community of Fortnite. And we're very happy to have you contribute. Cool. Thank you, Omar. Uh, all right. I'm going to start sharing the screen again to continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else am I missing? Chat. Okay, cool. All right. So let's go and set up uh, a dev environment for Cairo 1. Uh, so First of all, just a warning, we are going to be doing, using a lot of tools, we're very new, so we're going to be living on the edge, which means that some of these toolings are still uh, rough around the edges. Uh, so we have two main repositories that we're going to use. One's called Cairo Lang, which is written in Python, is where, the, where we have the Starnet CLI, and where we have the Cairo 0 to, to Cairo assembly compiler, right, so like the old compiler. Uh, but it still has the standard CLI. And then we have the Cairo repo without the line, which that's where we have the Cairo 1 compiler, the compiler to Sierra. And then also we have a compiler from Sierra to Chasm. And I'm going to go into detail why we have two different compilers. I'm going to explain that in section four, I think. Uh, but this one is written in Rust, not in Python. And it, it also has a VS Code extension that we can use, but we, we're going to have to build it from source so you can uh, have some you know, syntax completion and validation as well. So we're going to need uh, three main languages for setting up this dev environment. As I mentioned, this is going to simplify as time goes by, but for now we'll go with three. We're going to need Rust to compile the Carol one compiler. And I know it's a mouthful, but that's what we need to do. And also to compile the VS Code extension, right? Because right now it's not yet published to the to a marketplace. We're going to need Python, especially particularly 3.9, to create uh, an Starnet account so we can deploy and declare all these things and invoke to use the Starnet CLI because the Cairo land where the CLI lives is written in Python and we also need to sorry to declare to deploy and to invoke transactions on a Starnet finally we need Node.js uh, for packaging the VS Code extension before we can actually install it on our IDE so this is the plan for the light coding parts. Hopefully you can follow along, but we have the instructions shared for you here at the, at the bottom. So first we're going to compile Cairo 1 from source. Then we're going to test that the compiler is actually working by compiling a simple smart contract, a Cairo 1 smart contract. Then we're going to install the VS Code extension for Cairo 1. Then we're going to install the standard CLI. We're going to create a user account locally in your computer. So then you can declare an example of smart contract, you can deploy it to Starknet testnet, and then interact with it uh, using a block explorer and a regular wallet. So you have two links here at the bottom. Uh, I, I'm using the guide today, but in the Starknet book, we also have steps for performing this as well. Uh, so I'm gonna, this ends, okay. So for me, I'm gonna start a virtual machine so we can follow the steps from in the beginning, basically. So let me see. Give me a sec to start this. Ubuntu. So this clean stall. And start. I just want to know what the VM starts and I log in, share the screen in a moment. Okay. I'm in. And I'm going to follow my guidelines here. So guys, I just tried to set up my computer here with all the things that I need. 
before I can start doing live coding. Perfect. In the meantime, okay. cool. I'll be ready. So as I mentioned, I have a, a clean installation of an Ubuntu machine. The instructions for Mac OS are very similar. In the guide I put, whenever there's a small difference, I put there a comment, like an if else kind of blog. So the first step is to install Rust. So to install Rust, you basically, you follow the official instructions of how to install it. We want the release version of Rust. So, oops. I like him like that. We need to use curl to get it. I mean, let's see how I can increase the font size of this. I'm just going to proceed with the installation. How is the font size? Um, not that good. If you can zoom in, okay. okay. Yeah. Join. Terminal size, columns, rows, custom fonts here. I already changed it. Uh-huh. Custom fonts. Uh, I can increase it to hitting. Better now? Yes. Looking better. What do, what do you think, guys? Uh, they say it's okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Make it a little smaller. No. Oh. Okay. All right, cool. So I have Rust installed. It asks you to activate some things on your shell so you can just run this source or you can just close the terminal, which I'm going to do, and open a new one so the configuration takes place. And just to verify that Rust is installed, at least Rust up, we do this, Rust up version. And yes, so we have version 1.25.2. Okay, so Rust is installed, as I mentioned, we need Rust to compile the Caravan compiler from source. Um, so the next step is to actually download or clone the, the repo where the compiler for Caravan lives. So I have this command here. Oh, okay. All right, so this is the repo where the Cairo one compiler lives. And I'm gonna clone it to a specific folder on my on my home directory just called .cairo. I just want to have a, a particular location that I can always go back to because we're gonna do some, we're gonna have to do some mapping of the binaries. That's why I put it here. So after clone it, we should have it in the .cairo uh, folder. So if I come here, right? So we have here in the in the repository for Cairo one. So we need to activate a very particular tag, the latest tag available in the repo, because that's the the compiler that was used or supported right now by Stargate. So we need to make sure that we use the same. So this is why we enable or activate this particular tag, which is the latest tag on this repository, tag version one point zero zero alpha six. Right, so we are in detached mode in this particular commit of the Caravan repo. So now we can actually build uh, all the binaries using cargo and uh, using this command. I'm sorry it's going a little too fast just because you uh, have the guy. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, David. So Rajiv and also all more memory is are asking if we can share the commands. Yeah. Um, in the slides, which I share with you at the bottom of the last slide, where I have the live coding plan, you have, you see the reference. Uh, let me just put it here. And also if you can share again the link to the slides, that would be great. Oh, uh, okay. All right, link to the slides. Publish the web. These are the links. Where do I put it in the chat? Yes, please in the chat. Okay, so I put in the chat the link to the slides. And if you go to this last slide before let's let's start the setup, you see a link to the guide. 
and I share this link to you. This is the, the steps that I'm following basically that you don't see on the screen, but just using a secondary screen. But you also have this target book as a guide. It's just, this is exactly what I'm following in this uh, session. You should don't see it. Cool. Thank you, Willie. All right. So going back here. Oh, just a sec. I'm setting up again my environment. I'm sharing to the chat the link to the Starnet book where you can also see the commands. Please bear in mind that the Starnet book is very, very new, so we're working on that. <laughs> but that part is, is finished. Could you share that link, uh, Omar? I just. No, I, I will share the link right now. There. Okay. Link cool. to the Starnet book. Yes. All right, so the next step is to actually build the binaries, right? Using cargo build, and we use the release version of Rust. We don't want to use the, the, the latest or the edge. It's going to take a while, so it's a perfect time to answer some questions. Uh, perfect. So let's see. Uh, what do we have? When will the mainnet support Kero 1? My mic. It's live. It is supported already. You can deploy. It's right. It's, there's, there's there's a problem that keeps getting with compiling. Uh, okay, it's a particular problem. I will look at it. Uh, okay, so we're really sure that commands take you much crypto nerds and right if. Uh, in terms of energy consumption from Ransi from Carnival, uh, Ransi, we're looking at that particular question. We don't know, right? But uh, Manmeet already asked internally to see if we can get an answer as soon as possible. Ramsey, thank you very much for that. What are the benefits of the car virtual machine versus zero node TVMs? They have to be strong for DSL to win with solidity. And thank you very much, Paul Henry. He answered that the car VM is very specifically used by Starnet. Yes, exactly. And the benefits are is that again that Cairo is focusing only 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 on scalability. And this is something that the Tero virtual machine is not focusing on. They they focus on our on other stuff like decentralization, which is very relevant. But the kernel has the only goal of scaling Ethereum. So that allows to do certain kind of stuff that make us scale without having to follow all the rules of the EVM, which that, that are done for different purposes. So the kernel virtual machine should be able to allow for, a, for, a, for, for more scalability. That will be the main benefit. Uh, I don't know if you see any other question you want to answer right now, David. Mm -hmm. Which one? Uh, Tal, Tal is asking, most, and, and again, sorry sorry for answering this a little bit later. We have a lot of questions. So Tal is asking, most projects will probably be attracted to zero knowledge being changed because they are already a bunch of solidity tips. How easy would it be to transpile solidity to Cairo in the future? Is it better for projects to transpile or to create native on a starnet? And if you allow me, David, uh, let, us, uh, let, let me call here again, uh, Eliven Sasson, founder of the Starks, uh, inventor of the Starks, founder of the Star Wars. He said that indeed we will have actually a serial GBM. Danilo is leading that development. It is called Backout, which I, as Francois already shared. Thank you very much, Francois. Uh, but Eli said, our focus here is to scale gold using Cairo. So the real scale is going to be coming from Cairo, not from transpilers like the one we have, Warp, will be transpiling solidly into Cairo. However, building native Cairo code will be the real power of a stone. So indeed, uh, there's a lot of, of developers already for Solidity, but we think that developers can easily adapt. So most of you, I think, you know, at least two different languages. I don't know, maybe Python and, and JavaScript or something like that. And so I, I, we, we would only believe that, that developers will have no problem learning Cairo also, aside from Solidity. Also keep in mind that Standard gives you way more resources for executing transactions that you are, that's possible on on the limitation of gas fees on layer one. So that allows you to create more interesting applications. You can actually create things that are not possible at all to create on layer one. So do you actually yeah. want to just transpile your contract as is? You're gonna be missing a lot of interesting features. For example, a kind of abstraction that doesn't that exists yeah. technically on L1 now, but 
it's a little confusing because there's three different ways to have an account on layer one. On layer two, on a standard, everything is a smart contract. Everything is using a, a kind of abstraction or smart wallets. So really the idea is that when you have a different environment with different constraints or less constraints, you probably don't want to just rewrite the smart contract exactly the same way as in layer one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's worth mentioning that any zero knowledge project following the Ethereum virtual machine like the CK EVMs will have the same constraints as the EVM. <laughs> that being the uh, account construction, for example. Okay. Uh, do you guys know any open source project that have migrated fully to Cairo so that I can refer to their code? You can, I don't, let me share you the link to the Starnet Cairo 101, which you can already do. Uh, and it is, it is called, it's called has migrated to Cairo once, I guess. Also, uh, end to end testing. Mm. I don't know if we, we have a project already doing end 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 testing. So there are a lot of projects my way to care one, but they are doing it uh, maybe not open source or experimenting behind the, the scene. Also, Argent, I think will have soon their code care one, so that will be very good. But in the meantime, I will share to you the start care one one tutorials. Uh, that those are very 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 good for you to understand how to structure your your code. Uh, if you want to learn standard co uh, Cairo code, you can learn with it. But it is also very useful to learn uh, the syntax and the way to structure your project. So I will show it to you in the chat. Compilation is taking a while. It's pretty intensive. And also, it's, it's a virtual machine. It's not my host machine. So it has limited resources, but we're getting close. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so DV is asking why not both decentralization and scalability start disoriented more to the second one, but I don't see the trade-off to leave in the well, the first one. Mm, yes, sure. Well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, man, me and David, but uh, started is having both the decentralization from Ethereum and the scalability that is provided. Plus, we will have decentralization in the in the. There's there's no layer two that is decentralized right now, actually. We're working on that. We're working on, on deciding how we have centralization so we can decentralize the use of sequencers and so on. But I don't know, David, if you want to, to add something to this part. Well, the, the goal is to decentralize everything, right? It's just, it's a hard problem to solve. It took Ethereum a long time to do it right. It will take us a while also to, to do, it, do it right. So we need to approach it first. Let's, let's see that the technology works, that we can scale, and then we can decentralize. We, can, we have to tackle some big challenges once at a time to do it right. But that's the goal, to have it completely decentralized. With that. Okay, any other questions? Wow, we have a lot of questions today. That is great. Thank you very much for coming. We're very happy to have you here. I think those are all the questions that we can answer live. So we did it. <laughs> Oh, there's a question from Leo Cesaret. What are the most interesting use cases you are seeing of on-chain apps that will benefit from being able to access more compute? And Manmeet is answering right now. Do you want to answer live, Manmeet? Maybe. Yeah, just like the hats are dropped in the chat. One of the most exciting things that I've been seeing out here in San Francisco is uh, the new push towards ZK AI. Um, because AI and machine learning models are inherently very computationally intensive. So being able to prove inferences so people don't have to run them all over again is actually quite a powerful thing. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's one thing off the top of my head other than the obvious scalability to avoid Ethereum. Also, if you have to follow along, we're going back to the previous question uh, about digitalization. You can go to the standard forum that I put it on the chat link where we actually post our thoughts and ideas of how do we want to decentralize Starnet. So you can follow the discussion there and the proposal and you can comment. Perfect. Perfect. Yay. Anything you want to add, David, regarding the Starnet Cairo ground? And uh, again, no, no, again, if you want to share your Discord in the in the chat, so we can add you to the, to the group. We have a Discord. In case you haven't been added yet, please put your Discord there. Also join the Telegram community where it's uh, 
or A is also useful for in order to plan meetups if you want to do some in your cities or you want to talk with us. Do you have any questions? Please let us know there. All right, good news. Uh, it finished compiling. <laughs> so we can move on to the next step. Let's clear the, the terminal here. So now that we have the Kairuan compiler compiled, we want to add these binaries to our path, right? So we can execute these binaries from any any place in, in our file system. So an easy way to do it is just by adding to our configuration file for our shell. In this case, I'm using CS H, you might be using bash, so just modify it is depending on your terminal. If you're using bash, it will be bash RC. Just basically adding the path where we compile, where the compiled version of the Kairuan compiler lives to our path. So once with that, uh, I'm going to just close terminal and open again so the changes takes place and we're able to find the binary. So if this goes well, we should be able to call the Starnet compiler just to see the version and what is happening standard, oh, standard compile not compiler and there you go so we have the binary ready the binary is added to our path so we can use it to compile or Cairo one smart contracts to sierra so let's let's test that the compiler actually works so i'm going to create a, a folder just like a sample project we're just going to put a very simple smart contract and try to compile that so I'm just going to call this folder Darknet, Darknet. I'm going to get into it and in here I'm just going to create just like a test folder right and I'm going to create two folders just for usually I like to have one for where my source smart contract is and where the compiler folder so I'm just going to call the compiler folder Sierra so this is how my sample project looks like and I'm going to create uh, a file for my sample smart contract inside of source. So we'll call it sample.cairo. Okay. So I put the tree again. I should see the file. So let me open this with VS Code. David, a uh, quick question. Is there some kind of prettier or ESLint for Cairo? Prettier or ESLint? The closest will be this extension that we can install, but it's not exactly as prettier because prettier is a formatter. So I will say not yet. Uh, something like ESLint, the, the extension will, will work similarly, but not like prettier that actually formats when you save or something like that when you execute it. Uh, how do you increase the font size? Thank you. I'm just go. Oh, okay, here you go. Yes. So I'm just gonna put a very simple smart contract, right? I'm just gonna basically we use this macro contract, and then we create a module. It's called simple storage. Right. For now, today is not the goal to learn Cairo one, just to make sure the tooling is working. As you can see, we don't have any syntax highlighting or tooling or anything because we haven't done yet the work of installing the extension, but we have the smart contract. So let's try to, to compile it. So here I can just do Stagnet compile and I provide the file example.cairo and then the output. And it's going to be a JSON file, the output. So it worked, right? Our compiler is working. This is how the Sierra looks like with this very simple smart contract. Good. So we have confirmation that the compiler is working now. The compiler for Cairo one. Next step will be to actually install, install the VS code extension. And the source code for that extension, actually it's inside of the Cairo one repo. So let's go back to that repo that we store in Cairo. And we have here a folder called VS Code Cairo that we're gonna get into it, right? All right, we're in the right folder. So first of all, we're gonna need to have a Node.js installed. Uh, so in the case of Ubuntu, a simple way to install it will be with this command. There are multiple ways to install this. I'm just gonna use this to get the latest uh, Node version 19. Let me just expand this more. Uh, it's gonna work. Uh, 
could see him. So in theory, now I can do sudo apt, apt update, or I trying to install it. So now I can actually try to install Node.js. Okay, so if it works well, I should be able to do node and version. And yes, we have node version 19, the latest one installed on the computer. So we're good to actually now uh, compile the extension or just, well, when you use a JavaScript, you don't really compile, let's say you package it somehow. So first of all, we need to have it install a global package uh, called VS Code, VS ESE. So this is what you do for compiling extensions. So install it globally. It's under this name, ESE. This is provided by VS Code. So remember, all everything is being recorded and it will be all in YouTube. So you will be able to. We'll send you an email to, with the link so you can review all everything that we're doing right now. Yeah, and the guide that I'm following also we we have shared with you the link. So you're exactly what I'm doing. It's just documenting in a in a nice document there. You can follow along. Okay, so now uh, let's install dependencies for uh, JavaScript with npm install. Remember, inside of the VS Code Cairo with the extension leaves. Okay, that's, let me just update my NPM just in case that this is suggesting me to do. Oops, copy, paste. Uh, uh, oh, I need to do sudo. This is just optional. All right. So now I can actually package the extension previous to be able to be installed using this command package. All right, that we install this binary globally from NPM. Now we can use it here. This is just a temporary measure. Eventually the, the, the extension is going to be published to the marketplace and you will get it directly from VS Code without having to do that. But Remember, we're leaving on the edge, so this is how it needs to be done right now. So now we have the package that we can actually install it. We install it to VS Code with this command, right? Solid extension, this is the file that we just created now. We go ahead, and in theory, should be installed. So let's try... Uh, Right, so if I open the extension here, okay, I can see that it is, it is now installed, Cairo 1, it's called extension, but we need to be configured because it's asking for where's the path for this particular binary, the Cairo language server. This is one of the binaries that we compiled from using Rust from source, so we need to provide this path. And to provide that path, let's go back to... That's going to be the target release. Let me just go back here let's go to target. This is where all the binaries are placed. This is my absolute, uh, let's say, path to it. I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to put it here and a slash with the name of the binary. And I think I need to probably close this and turn it on again. So it takes, let's see, let me close the VS code. And oops, I need to go back to my workflow. Or maybe just open here. And it's not taking. Okay, now it's working. Now I get syntax highlighting and it's going to complain you do some things wrong, like in this case, right? So it's a nice helper when you write Cairo 1 code. So cool. So we have the VS Code extension working. Yes, Omar. It I was, sorry, it's worth mentioning that, as David said, I want to repeat that, that we're not learning, learning Cairo right now, but we will do, and we'll have the chapter of the book ready for in a couple of days. 
So you can start learning Cairo in, uh, by yourself, and then we can come here and already with more co uh, knowledge of Cairo, and we we'll also teach you some Cairo. And also we have some tutorials like Starlings we will share in a minute, so you can start also learning Cairo. Yeah, today it's just about the, the dev environment, not really about Cairo. Well, let me put a little more complex Cairo code here, because we actually want to deploy it today. Uh, yeah, Benny? Oh my God, fixed, yeah. And I'm not going to really explain how this works. We're going to talk more about Cairo in future sessions. I just want to make sure that we can compile this and we can deploy it to Starnet. So let me just recompile this. We did before. If you ever go back to, oh my God. Okay. I'm just going to copy this. Uh, copy it. Can I paste it here? No. Anyway. Tag, net, compile. Okay, so we compile in the new version of the smart contract. So this will be more and more complex now. You can see here, right? Way more complex. So this is the code that we actually deployed to Starnet that we give to the sequencer, the Sierra smart contracts. Okay, so let's keep moving on. The next step now, because to in interact with the Stargate, we used to use the Stargate CLI. The Stargate CLI is written in Python, so we need to have Python 3.9 in particular to be installed in our system. So to install a very particular version of Python, at least in on Ubuntu, you will need a particular uh, PPA. Uh, this one here. Every time. Magnify this, okay. So I add this repository to my APT. It's because we need Cairo, uh, sorry, Python 3.9. We installed Python 3.10, it might not work. Now I do update my references. And I'm ready to install Python 3.9 using these two packages, especially for development, because we also need to have virtual environments. Thanks a little bit. Okay, if it all went well, we should have now Python 3.9 install version yeah there it is you do have it so now let's actually install the Cairo CLI um, so to use the Cairo CLI to install it we need to have one global dependency called GMP so you can use that this command to install it this is required for the Cairo for the sorry for the stagnant CLI not the Cairo CLI stagnant CLI you need this global dependency Now, uh, let's go back to our project that we were working on, uh, to call it Starknet test. Okay. We're back to our project. And I'm going to create a virtual machine here for, sorry, a virtual environment for Python. So when I install packages, I don't want to install it globally, just want to install it per project. So to do that, you do this command, you define that you want a virtual environment, and then you give it a name. I'm just going to call it Cairo. Uh, um, right. Then you activate that virtual environment so you can start installing. Um, it's called Cairo. Cairo bin activate. So as you can see, now we're inside of the Python virtual environment. So we can install the Carolang package. Just before I do that, I'm just going to upgrade pip to the latest version just to be safe. And now I can actually install Kyrolang, pip install Kyrolang, which is going to give you the standard TLI. Let's see. And it's installed for this particular project, it's not installed globally. It 
if you are on a Mac, it, it, this might fail. I put some instructions on the guide. What's the alternative command that you can run on a Mac? It was happened to me that it failed, so I found a solution. It's a more complex command, but it works. All right, so if this is working, so we should be able to execute the binary called StarkNet, which is the one used by the CLI. And there we have it. We have 0 0.11.0.2. .0 Perfect. So, um, so we'll use this, the StarkNet CLI in every command you will have to define to which network you want to deploy or interact. You use that with flags. And also you need to define which type of wallet. Remember that in, on StarNet, every wallet is a smart contract and you have to define to the CLI how the smart contract looks like and how the smart contract is able to verify signatures. So to be able a little bit easier for now and not going too much into detail until we get to those sections, I'm going to uh, define two environmental variables on my on my shell that the StarNet CLI is going to use and going to make us our comments look a little bit simpler. So let me open uh, the my profile configuration, in my case, HRC. Uh, what? Open. All right. Now go to the bottom, and I'm going to add two environmental variables. Uh, one is to tell every time that I run a StarNet command that always targets the testnet. Alpha girly instead of main it, right? I don't want to spend money in it right now. And also to tell them, because it's a kind of abstraction, which type of wallet I want to use to sign transactions. So I'm uh, using this one here. Okay. So this would be export as well. It's not export. Export. If she doesn't mess up, blah, blah, blah. it's using an, a version of the open sampling wallet. Okay. This looks good. So I should be able now, if I, if I close my terminal and I open it again, should be able to access these environmental variables. I do echo, um, start net network. There you go. So it's installed, it's available on our shell. So now next step, before we can deploy anything, we need to create a user account in our computer because we need to pay for declarations and deployments. So let's go back to our project for now. Uh, Starknet test. Let me activate again the virtual environment for Python. I wrote bin. Activate, okay. So take, because the, the starting CLI is only available in this Python virtual environment. So create the new account, at least to get the address of our user account, we use this command, the starting new account, and we give it a name. Oops, right here. Right. So using this, the starting CLI to create a new account in my computer, and I'm going to give it a name, it's going to look at the 0.11.0.2, right? So I can have different wallets uh, once the, the network uh, keeps upgrading. So by doing that, it's not going to create the user account yet. It's just going to give me the, the address because the address is always, it can be known uh, before you deploy because it's just an, an algorithm that will be always the same. So this is going to be the address of my user account while I deploy it. So I'm just going to copy this one here. And the next step is just, I need to send test if to this account. I need to fund my wallet even before the wallet exists on chain. This is called a count counterfactual deployment, I think it's called. This is a common feature when you have a kind of abstraction. So I'm going to send a small amount of if to this address. So let me open, I think you should have, should have a wallet here in this VM that I could use. But I have, oh no, maybe I don't have. Yeah, I have to send it from my, so let me just bring this up. 
and give me a sec to unlock my wallet not if we, without sharing my key or anything just a second all right okay so as you can see i have bravos here I have another account which already has some test if on girly so i'm just going to send some test if there so i need just to copy the the address and from here just going to send some amounts Let's send 0 0.05 test if. So I'm using Bravos. It says that it doesn't exist on chain, which is fine. Uh, this is the counterfactual deployment. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about a kind of traction in future sessions. For now, just follow along. All right. So I've sent a transaction to Starnet Testnet using my wallet. I can follow a lot of transaction here on a block explorer. So we need to wait until the transaction gets at least to the pending state before we can continue. So I think right now on test that blocks are produced every three minutes, if I'm not mistaken. That's why you see the counter. So let's wait a little bit. Let me increase the font size so you can see better. So once we get to the pending state, it means that I can actually, I have the funds available on that particular wallet and I can continue with actually the on-chain deployment of my user account. Again, this is a feature of a kind of abstraction. Hopefully we can make it easier for you in the future with tools like Scarp that we haven't talked about it yet. Questions in the meantime, Omar or people just post questions. Yeah, we don't have a lot of questions. We have a question from Michael. Sorry, Michael, for the late reply. He's having some trouble combining. I, uh, there are a couple of questions for you there, Michael. Yeah. Are you using are you using a, a log local, Michael? And the second question is, are you using what version of the compiler? Can you check Starnet slash compile slash slash version, please? Or if you're using Scarf, let us know. Scarf is using the, the newest compiler version because I think there's a problem with that part. Uh, okay. Uh, Dimitri is asking, it would be nice opportunity to show gay faucets. Oh, it's a good okay. point. Yes. You, I, in this case, I'm sending Ether from another account that I have, but you can actually use a faucet. Uh, where is it? Tools, faucet. There you go. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat, the link to the faucet, where you just put your address and it will give you some amount. Of it. The faucet has the limitation that this, it has a, a limit of how much test if it can give you every 10 minutes. So if I try to use it now, I say, oh, you have to wait 10 minutes and I don't have time to wait 10 minutes. That's why I went the other way. But if you are more patient, you can use it this way. You will get some test if on your address. Okay. So now that we have, yeah, Omar, go ahead. Hey, hey so, sorry, David. Uh, here, Gleam is, okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Gleam is mentioning something very important in the chat, but we can go ahead and mention it later. Okay. So now that I have, uh, test if associated with this address, I'm actually going to deploy my user account, which is a smart contract to this address. So let me get back to my notes, put in my secondary screen. Okay. 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 So the, to deploy my user account, just clear the screen here. I use this command. So again, you see the standard CLI. Now you see the deploy account command. Uh, always using this particular account that I created before, the one that we know the address. So if I do that, it's going to actually deploy my user account to testnet. And you can see, it's... so it sends the deploy account contract transaction. So we can follow along the transaction using this hash. On um, stack scan, dark scan, where are you? Test that. Put here the transaction hash. 
because we need to wait until it gets to at least the pending state. That's when we know it's ready to be to be used. Because what we really want to do is to deploy the the Cairo one smart contracts that we were uh, I showed you before that we have in VS Code. Okay, so it's on the pending state. So now we technically have now uh, a user account that we can use to deploy and to invoke transactions. Cool. Let me just clear here and let's go back now. So before we can deploy a smart contract on a standard, you have to first declare it. The reasons we've got explained in the next session, but for now we're gonna execute this command. Just gonna try to explain what it what it does. So basically it's gonna upload our Sierra, the Sierra code of a smart contract using this account to pay for fees, for gas fees. And declaring is the previous step before you can deploy because on a standard you can deploy multiple instances of the same declared code. We're gonna talk more about that when we go to a kind of abstraction. For now, I'll just follow along. So when we try to execute this, send this transaction to testnet, it's gonna fail because this smart contract was deployed, was declared before actually by me. So, so it should tell me there's an error. Yes. The error is that it says the class hash, blah, 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 is already declared, right? And that's what I was expecting. That's fine. It means that I can just go directly to the deploy. I don't have to declare. But because sometimes you, you don't know, it's better to just try to declare and see if it fails, and you can move to the deployment. So, oh, wait, did I copy what was the address? Then I used the address of my account. Just a sec. I have to find out to which address I send the, the account. Location number, transaction center address. Sorry, just a moment. All right. Yeah, I forgot to take note of what was the address of our user account, but now I have it. Because we need to send the deploy transaction. Uh, let me try again the declare because I need to take, take note of the of the class hash, which I didn't do before. So some people are having trouble using the using the post set, so it's very understandable. We are sending you it's, or David, do we have a method to send it it's uh, without using the post set right now? No, right now. Uh there's something okay. we talk right now how to how to do better because we know the faucet has a limitation. Yes, so, so we so have to... a lot of people right now asking for it. Yeah, no, it's that's something that we, we that's why we yeah, we kinda knew but it's hard to get around. Hopefully that's one of the things that we need to improve for next time we do Basecamp, for sure. So to deploy the smart contract, we need to provide the class hash that is provided here in the previous account. I'm just gonna remove this because this is a previous thing that I did comment. And the class hash is here. And with this, we should be able to deploy Our smart contract. Okay, so the transaction was sent for deploying our smart contract. We can follow along here. I need to remember to not delete anything from the terminal because I need those addresses. Uh, paste. Okay, paste. Good. Okay. So this is transaction to deploy the smart contract that we wrote in Cairo 1. So we need to wait until it gets to the pending state uh, before we can actually start interacting with it. So let's wait a couple of seconds. Is there any question in the meantime, Omar? No, no, no. Uh... Michael is asking, will there be a Rust-based CLI? And the answer is yes, there would be. 
Yeah, it will be exactly. soon, but don't. Yeah. Uh, but don't worry. The Python one is going to be working very soon, and it's going to be the same. Uh, also, a lot of people are asking for it. Maybe my meet if you have some it and you can help me send to Thomas, please. That would be great. In the meantime, that you know uh, that all the transactions that I make, I send you the trans the the it, and you should be able to find it in your. Now you can deploy your wallet because. The transactions were successful, so you can deploy your your accounts. Yeah, so our smart contract has been deployed, so we can actually now interact with it because we know the address, this one. And as we can see, you can see first of all there is a Cairo one smart contract, and we can go to the read write section. And if we compare to our code, you can see that our smart contract had two functions: one to increase balance and one to get balance. One to this is read only. This is for modifying the state. And if you see in this explorer, you see the get balance. Right now, it's going to be zero because it has no value. But we can actually use the write to increase it. I'm just going to connect, oh, the connect the wallet. Wait a second. This is one thing that I didn't prepare for <laughs> to install a wallet here. So let me just do it on my Mac. Copy. Uh, why let me explain this? Uh, Rafael is asking, can we bridge early it to start it? Yes, we can. You can ask, you can get some it. For example, you see in a faucet, I don't remember the name, Paradigm has a faucet that can give you early it to layer one. So you can send it to your MetaMask account, for example. And then from there, you can bridge it using the bridge. With, I will send you the link in the chat. And you can bridge it to the. Uh, Actually, Clement already shared the bridge. Thank you very much, Clement. Uh, Stargate.starnet.io, it is on the chat. So you can use that to bridge, to connect your MetaMask account to your Parabolus or Argent account, and then you can bridge that it to your account. So it is relatively simple, yes. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, just gonna, oh, it's like, oh, we can go back to questions after. Perfect. Then just so familiar, we, so I think some people, might be living right now because of the time. So is there any question? What is it? Sorry, what is the, the homework? Is there any homework for next? We'll send it in the, in the email. We'll send an email with the instructions. Ah, okay. We'll send you an email. Thank you, Luis. All right. So I'm just going to uh, send the value 10 to the increased balance used in my wallet. I'm going to sign this transaction. And then we wait a little bit until it gets to Dependent state, so we should be able to do the the read operation and see the value of ten coming back. So let's wait a little bit. Uh, let me see what questions we have. When will the main it support care one? Okay, we answered that one. Somebody, oh, are we are we sure Omar that is deployed to care one? Uh, What's sorry, uh, Cairo wants to deploy to, to main it because Michael is saying no, uh, no, no, no. It seems like uh, it's a little bit more complex. Like mm. the, the like a contract has to be tested for a while and then it can be uploaded to the mainnet. So we cannot do it right now. Mm. Gotcha. They know that. Okay, the transaction is about to get to the pending state, which a little bit. It means the block. Mm -hmm. While we wait for that, Anony an anonymous attendee is asking, it is having an error while deploying the account. It is called you know, started error code on initialized contract. It is likely because you haven't uh, sent it to your account and then deployed the account. So you have to first, as David showed, you first have to send to the address of your account the it, and then you can deploy it. So there you have it. Now I, I yeah. sorry, I thought you were finished. Yeah. I query the balance again. Now I get the value 10. So to confirm that actually our transaction went through and modified the state of the smart contract. So now we can read the new value. So that concludes the, the tutorial to set up the environment. It's a long one, it's a complex one. Again, Cairo one is fairly new. Um so hopefully just to do a brief summary, we had to install Rust, Python, and Node.js. We compile the Cairo one binaries using Rust. Then we configure those binaries to be available anywhere. 
uh, adding to the to the path. Then we install uh, also Cairo Lang, and we install Python to be able to execute Cairo Lang, and we install the VS Code extension as well, so you get this uh, nice syntax highlighting and some easy errors to spot there when you write. Uh, thank you very much for staying so long. It was supposed to finish a while ago, but it took longer. Hopefully, it was useful. You have the guides there, and if you have more questions, please use Discord, and hopefully, you will be able to use the faucet eventually and get some tests if. Yes. Also, if some some of you are not able to to get some it, let us know, please, in, in the Telegram. So I sent it to as much people as possible, but I run I, I run right, <laughs> so so I will need to recharge. But let us know in Telegram, please. I won't be able to to store all your addresses right now. But uh, send it to the Telegram or bridge it. And thank you very much to to Clement who helped us a lot in this. Also, Glenn, thank you very much. And Glenn mentioned also something very important that you have to change your contract hash. It, uh, okay, well, no, no, no worries. We'll see it the next the next time, and we'll add it to the book. So thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Take care. See you next week. Bye bye. We'll send you an email. Wait for it. Thank you.